Good day everyone, and welcome to Lubrication Explained. Today we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of used oil analysis, specifically some tips around how to take a sample. So when, where, and how you sample greatly impacts the quality of the results. So the first thing that we need to do is establish a sampling schedule. One of the things that we want to do here is we want to try and integrate that schedule with all the other plan, plan maintenance activities that we have. So if we're visiting a gearbox once every six months, that's a great time to, to take a sample. I'll have another video um, on recommendations for sampling intervals, but unless you kind of integrate it with the rest of your maintenance program, it likely won't happen. The other thing that we're aiming for is consistency. So we're trying to take a representative sample at the same point each time. So we want to sample from the same sampling point at a consistent interval, and that will make the results trendable. We also, where possible, want to sample at operating temperature. There's obviously limitations around that. So if you are testing a thermal oil system, we don't want you putting your hands in 200 degrees Celsius oil. But where possible, we try to sample very close to the operating temperature. We also generally will try and sample through a sampling valve if that's available, using a va vacuum pump or a sampling tube. Keep in mind that we want to maintain sample hygiene. And the reason for that is because the laboratory analysis is looking for particles in the oil that's typically less than eight microns. So in order to do that, we need to clean the area around the sample point, just with a rag though, not using any kind of degreasing agents or anything which will contaminate the sample. We also want to flush the new sample bottle with the, with the oil. Uh, this should happen before we actually collect our final sample. For particle count analysis, if that's really important, say in a close tolerance hydraulic system, or if you have a turbine where you're concerned about servo valve clearance, it's best to flush about three times. And this is because even new sample bottles that have been freshly delivered can sometimes have some contaminants inside them. Also, make sure that we're not reusing sample bottles. Tendency is to try to do this to save costs, but the reality is you're just throwing away good money. To give you a sense for how small eight microns is, it's in the region of about the size of a blood cell. We also want to try to avoid sampling from a drain plug. Now, sometimes this is the only place, right? But the reason we recommend against it is it because it makes it difficult to obtain a representative sample. Right? That's because all the crud and you know, sludge and varnish accumulates at the bottom of the sump. And so when we go to take a sample, all of that stuff is going to fall straight into our sample bottle. So where possible, we want to let out a stream of oil and then catch a sample midstream. That'll help us avoid a lot of those contaminants. And like I said before, let's try to avoid using degreasing agents to clean equipment. The next thing that we want to do is inspect the sample. The reason for this is that the person taking the sample is kind of our first line of defense. Rather than waiting for results, sometimes simply looking and smelling the sample will give you an indication of the, the equipment health. So the sample needs to have a couple of things. We need sufficient volume so that we've filled to the correct fill line on the bottle but the oil itself should be relatively clear and free of sediment. If we see kind of darkening or discoloration, now that could be a sign of soot loading or oxidized oil, or it could be normal. So it's known, for example, that in certain turbine oils, antioxidant additives can change color in use, and that's perfectly normal. So this is a great reason why 
the sample taker should also be consistent because they're going to know what is normal for that equipment. And if they start to see something abnormal, then that might be something that they flag to the maintenance team. Similarly, sediment could also be a sign of either oil contamination, so we have contamination in the equipment, or it could be an example of sample contamination. Now we want to try to avoid samples with visible sediment because visible sediment can actually damage laboratory equipment. As a result, if you send in a sample that has visible sediment in the bottom, it's very likely that your used oil analysis provider will not complete the full set of tests. So again, we're kind of throwing away good money. One of the other things to take a look at is if the sediment is magnetic, that could be an indication of kind of rust or maybe even severe wear, and that would correspond with an increase in the PQ index. So again, something to look out for, and a sample taker should be able to recognize this immediately. Other things that they might spot is free water. That would be a sign of water contamination. And where it's contamination of water inside a bulk oil system, we expect bubbles of water to sit at the bottom of the oil sample. Now keep in mind, that's not always true. There are some uh, exceptions to this rule, notably polyalkylene glycols. In that instance, PAGs are actually uh, have a higher specific gravity than water, and therefore water will float to the surface. Haze or cloudiness can be an indication of contamination with water, wax, coolant, or refrigerant. Now, a certain degree of water contamination is probably to be expected in most applications. So, as a general guide for what is normal, you should be able to read a newspaper or something behind the sample. That's a kind of rule of thumb for knowing that there, there is an excessive contamination from water. The next thing that we want to do is log and send the sample with your used oil analysis provider. Generally, all these programs will require you to assign the sample bottle to a specific asset. This means that on the back end, the software will be able to know that that sample is linked to that specific asset. We then also want to document as much operating information as we can. And in my experience, this is generally one of the steps which is not taken because maybe the person who takes the sample and registers the sample doesn't have access to this information. However, if we can doc document the, the date at which the sample was taken, maybe the, the number of hours on the oil, the number of hours that the equipment has done, uh, whether there's been an oil change, whether there's been a filter change, all this information is key to being able to get good insights out of the final results. Finally, and I cannot stress this enough, put it in the provided mailing container to ensure that the bottle has integrity all the way to the lab, and then mail the sample. You would be amazed at the number of samples that actually just sit on a desk completely unused. So hopefully you've got a flavor for some easy tips and tricks uh, that will help your used oil analysis program. If you've got any questions, leave them in the comments section below. And this has been Lubrication Explained.